Hi, everybody. Thank you so much for joining us today um, for the State of Retail and CPG, led by one of our principal and global category leads here at Microsoft. This event is being brought to you by the Microsoft Reactor. Um, you can find us at microsoftreactor.com or on meetup.com for a list of all of our upcoming events. And at the end of today's session, we will be sharing some links on where you can find out more about the reactors as well. So I'm going to pass it off to Sahir and we will get started. Um, there is a little icon that looks like two text bubbles with a question with a question mark in it. If you click on that, that is where you can um, ask questions and we will be in there answering questions throughout the event as well as at the end. Thank you so much and Sahir, if you would like to get started. Hey, thanks, uh, uh, Dion and the Reactor team who helped us uh, put this webinar together. So uh, good afternoon, good evening, or good morning, wherever you're based uh, and wherever you're joining in from. Uh, welcome to uh, Azure uh, and AI Teams um, Retail Industry Update and Power Panel. My name is Sahir Anand. I lead uh, the industry category for retail and CPG. Uh, within Azure plus AI, which is part of cloud commercial communities. So what we'll try and do today is we'll cover off uh, three things. Uh, first, we'll uh, look at the state of retail uh, in the present times. So really assess the industry, look at some interesting data, um, and which really talks to the health of the industry as also the state of uh, technology uh, that is uh, that we, we the, that's the the business we are we're all in. Uh, we'll then cover the Azure update. So what's the latest in terms of Azure and Azure Marketplace? And I'll talk about that in a few minutes. And then the most exciting part of today's conversation is the discussion with six uh, senior executives, uh, all six Microsoft uh, ISV partners. They all specialize in very unique areas and uh, we'll bring them into this conversation and uh, have a real insightful discussion. So uh, stay till the end is uh, something important for everybody who's who's on this webinar today. So let me just quickly introduce the power panel and you'll hear from them very soon. Uh, so we are joined by six very interest, interesting ISV solution providers. Um, we we have uh, from the world of uh, AI, uh, sales and marketing AI, uh, Observer. So Hugh Coleman, who's the CEO from Observer. Um, Alex Cisco, uh, who's the Chief Growth Officer of um, Everseen which is uh, again a very interesting AI based. Uh, uh, loss prevention. Uh, retail security solution provider in terms of you know really point of sale and in store solutions really very very interesting solution. Uh, point R another very um, timely solution for this uh, these times that we are in. They do location based um, marketing and messaging uh, using their solutions. Uh, Zine One uh, e-commerce personalization solution. Uh, quite differentiated and uh, a recent partner of ours. And then we have Imperity. Uh, Imperity is a very uh, interesting CDP customer data pl platform solution. Again, in the in the customer data platform side of the house, there's a lot of activity these days. And then uh, from Anchor.ai or Forecast Horizon, uh, a demand forecasting solution provider um, as along with services, and that that is uh, the CPO uh, from uh, from Anchor.ai. Uh, Kaushik has joined us, so thank you, everyone. Uh, ev you know who make up this power panel, and uh, thank you for joining in. And we'll be with you uh, to to really uh, get your insights very shortly. Um, state of retail. So when I joined. Uh, uh, you know, if you think about last month, towards the end of last month, I had hosted another webinar to give you an update uh, on retail and CPG. 
And during that webinar, I had um, used this analogy of uh, the, the good, bad and the ugly. And so using the same analogy, I want to show you the difference where we were and where we are today. Um, and so where we are today is essentially the story hasn't gotten a whole lot better when it comes to the slump in retail. So what we have seen is so far in 2020, about 18 bankruptcies uh, from the likes of Brooks Brothers to Lucky Brand, uh, New York and Company, which announced their bankruptcy in, on Monday. Uh, but you, you're seeing a theme here that retailers who are in the apparel luxury space are particularly vulnerable and some sporting goods, some healthcare retail. And so uh, what we what what is important to note here is that this number of 18 bankruptcies how much more will we see of that in the second half of the year? Now we are entering the second half of a uh, typical retail uh, fiscal. Uh, and where do we end up? Do we end up at 36 or, or fewer retailers uh, who hopefully uh, will survive this onslaught? But uh, you know, the 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 woes of retailers in this in these present times. Uh, let's not uh, you know undermine that at all. You know, they, there are problems that retailers are facing. And so the problems are associated with foot traffic, malls not opening up sooner um, than they, they should. Uh, the, 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 the flattening of the curve uh, in terms of COVID had meant that retailers could open up slowly or shortly. Uh, unfortunately, where we stand today, there is a second wave coming. So it's obviously challenging for retailers. And there, but let me, let me be uh, clear that there is some good news that I'll be sharing with you. Uh, there are some bright spots too. In terms of uh, retail's uh, uh, sister industries like travel, uh, we, it, we the reason I bring up travel is because not just because travel is related uh, in terms of customer traffic and footfall, but there's a lot of travel retail out there that uh, helps uh, with airport retail, travel retail, uh, food services related sales at global airports, uh, uh, you know, uh, it's not just at home, but globally. Uh, those uh, travel uh, issues continue. Uh, example is that uh, the number of passengers are down significantly. The number of departures are down, and that's just one example of uh, a company called Allegiant where they, they have cited that numbers are not looking that good. Um, moving on to the next, um, um, the next part of the analogy that I wanted to share with you is the bad. So where I think re retail is in in a tough spot right now is in the brick and mortar space, and there is no doubt that um, luxury and soft lines have uh, suffered in the last few months. But keep in mind, I'm not talking about the entire year. I'm just talking about March, April, May half of March, April and May. So let's not write the entire story based on the data that has been reported so far, but so far in the last two and a half months or so, uh, or three months or so, uh, soft lines and luxury stores were primarily impacted. Uh, and in fact, all retailers have ramped up plans to close underperforming stores, all retailers. And I'm talking, you know, th th this goes across the board. Um, so this is a good time for retailers to have that correction mode in place. Uh, nearly six out of 10 store closings are located in malls. So if you're a retailer that depended on mall traffic and malls being closed due to COVID, um, this, is a, this is a situation that you're dealing with. But if you have standalone stores, the likelihood that you're opening back up with all the precautions uh, and with all the contactless uh, processes uh, you're in that much more better standing uh, to be able to recover sales. Um, but according to the research uh, done by uh, some of our research firms in the industry, uh, retailers can expect about 25K in, in uh, whereabouts in store closings, which would be significantly higher, uh, about uh, 2X from what uh, the similar store closings in, uh, in the last fiscal 2019. So that is uh, the bad. The good, 
yeah, believe it or not, there is a lot of good to be shared, and that's why I, I saved it to, uh, for the end. Um, there has been a reopening impact felt, no doubt. Uh, retail sales have improved by almost 18% in May compared to April, but keep in mind the April base was low, so please keep that in mind. Um, the and and but but nevertheless. It has been despite limited capacity operations. Um, so the base must in April must have been that low that despite limited capacity in the stores, uh, the numbers have uh, have shown improvement. The CPG industry uh, to share with you, the in-store CPG sales have been quite uh, robust, almost a 20% improve compared to same week last year. In fact, CPG online sales have shown a very impressive jump of almost 27 plus percent uh, compared to the same week last year. So CPG is really doing well, uh, but keep in mind that April base was low. Uh, please keep because numbers can be deceiving in that you, you have to take the entire perspective. But what's also really happening is that across meat products, across food products, um, uh, you know, frozen food. Um, if you go to the perishables, there is a price inflation trend that both CPG consumers as well as retailers are trying to uh, deal with today. So there's no doubt, just like how it happened in 2008, after the 2008 crash, market crash, and the slowdown and the recession that had set in, there was a price inflationary trend even back then. And we are seeing the same effect right now in place in CPG. If you look at the the price inflation across categories, so it's these are not easy times for consumers uh, from that standpoint. We are paying more uh, compared to what we were paying three months ago because of cost in inflation uh, and the cost going higher for uh, CPG companies in terms of pick back ship, in terms of production, in terms of transportation logistics. OK, so there's a there's a small bright spot for clothing that they gained in in May. But keep in mind that April was a very low base for clothing. It was a very disappointing month for clothing and accessories in general. Who are the real and consistent winners? Which segments in retail are consistently growing? That means despite the the pandemic, they, uh, these segments have grown. E-commerce, food and beverage. Believe it or not, auto parts. They had a week May, April, maybe not that week, but it was somewhere in the middle if you were to put it in a stack rank. And then May, they really jumped back up uh, because people started repairing their cars and taking care of their household items. Uh, general merchandise has shown an improvement, building materials. Uh, so uh, folks consistently putting in money into their homes, into, uh, into improvements that they want to make in their homes. So. These are the four or five segments that are showing real and consistent growth this year. In fact, you, if you compare it to Wall Street, companies within these segments are seeing the highest spike um, or among the highest spikes in terms of their uh, uh, growth rate as far as the evaluation in the stock market. The third point I'll make is that there's a very strong consumer, um, uh, call it a consumer behavioral shift towards food and online uh, retail. US food and beverage sales have increased uh, month uh, year over year on an, an adjusted basis in May. It's a very good sign. Meal kits, food services, seafood, hand sanitizers, pet care, all these categories. In fact, spicy chicken sandwich, believe, believe it or not, have, have re that category has also reaped a, a lot of gain if, according to the data we've received from restaurant associations and also uh, the likes of Grubhub. In fact, online retail has had its best month uh, in a long, long time. You've not heard of these kind of numbers. 81% growth in May alone, led by sportswear, housewares, gaming. And according to eMarketeer, e-commerce growth, despite an overall drop in overall retail sales of 10.5%, e-commerce growth will see an 18% growth for this year. And that's spectacular. So on that note, having covered the good, bad and the ugly, I would like to talk to you about what are the analysts saying? It's very important to not listen to what just just not just what technology companies are saying. Very important to listen to the voice of 
uh, third party independent analysts and associations. According to RBC Capital, the four or five areas that have, that have experienced accelerated adoption and growth in this pandemic are e-commerce, streaming content, online food delivery, gaming, as well as cloud consumption. That's what, according to RBC Capital, lead analyst, those are the areas that have seen a lot of growth despite the deadly pandemic. According to our NRF, a cautious uh, approach, where NRF is saying that full recovery is still ways off. They have seen some positive data in, in May, but uh, that has to be taken into context because April was basically a shutdown, a complete shutdown. Uh, according to Gartner, uh, I would say kind of a half cautious, half positive message coming from Gartner that retailers can use this time to predict and preempt a lot of the disruption that is going on in the industry right now. And they have to adapt to different market scenarios and different market channels uh, in order to survive the storm. Forrester also has a kind of a, a mixed uh, kind of a message where they're saying they're advising retailers and brands, CPG brands, uh, to move quickly, to prioritize and to invest and not take their eye off investments that are critical because this is just July, folks. July and August is generally very slow in retail and CPG. Considering, you know, people's vacations, etc. It's summer, uh, what have you. Uh, when you come into uh, August and September back to school and then Q4, which is holiday, these months are going to be very important. So what Forrester is recommending is absolutely right, is that despite everything that's going on, you can't, can't take the eye off of a uh, the important business and technology initiatives. What is Microsoft's analysis? What we are saying and we reinforce uh, in talking to our customers and our strategic uh, conversations that we are having with CMOs and CIOs and CTOs and all the other uh, executives in retail. Uh, this is the time to double down on digital. There's no doubt about that for companies that are digital first, they will experience solid growth for companies that are digital second. That means they led with stores, but have invested heavily in the last five years in improving their online channels. They will see explosive growth. Uh, in many cases, companies like Target have seen 180% growth in their online sales compared to last year. A lot of those sales have actually been uh, fulfilled from the stores. So digital and investment in digital related processes such as uh, BOPUS uh, or uh, curbside pickup, uh, those type of investments are going to be very important in these times. And, and very, very critical is the data and AI related uh, upheaval. In retail, this is the time to focus on data and AI. It's not just to predict and, and uh, preempt the outcomes that you're looking for in terms of customer behavior or inventory movement or uh, logistics and fulfillment, but also to plan your upgrades well in advance, to look at data very carefully, to look at, look out for positive outcomes and areas that you can continue to invest. You cannot sit idle uh, because business has to be protected. Business has to be continued and, and looking out for those po positive outcomes can only come from data and AI. So what, what is research telling us? What is Microsoft's research telling? Uh, and what is the independent research telling us? Where we see analytics capabilities today and AI capabilities, most companies see themselves as being middle of the road right now. Where they seek their competitors, most companies see their competitors ahead of them. And where they would like their company to be in the next two to three years is to be at par with their competition. So that is kind of what research is telling us, independent research from the industry. And how can retailers do that? They can do that in three ways. They can do that by improving sales and marketing, being very focused on, on loyalty programs, automated AI-based product recommendations, uh, and customer insights and customer data-related uh, insights. But can in all these areas, more importantly, they could be focused on areas like click and collect and demand forecasting, and areas like dynamic pricing. These are the areas that are going to give retailers the ROI in the short to medium term. Obviously, the focus should be on e-commerce, but you also have to use your stores very wisely, and some of our experts are going to be talking about that very soon. 
some examples I want to give of partners who are doing a great job working with our, our customers and some very large retailers, including the likes of Walmart and others. Uh, what we are seeing is that when it comes to three very transformational changes in the industry today, those are going to be driven by data and AI, whether it's in the area of product recommendations and increasing cart sizes, whether it is in areas like real time pricing to drive sales, adjust pricing according to customer churn because customer churn is a trend right now or improving your online local pickup for customers who are 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 focused on contactless uh, click and collect related pickup operations of retailers because they value that right now. All our partners are working on it, but I've given some examples here of some partners uh, examples that they are focusing on these areas and that's leading to transformational change. Um, very quickly, I'd like to talk talk to you about where what is the state of Azure and Azure Marketplace. According to Forrester, we are looking at a trend by the end of 2023 that B2B e-commerce marketplaces are going to account for almost two trillion dollars in in spend. That includes infrastructure as a service, platform as a service and software as a service. What does an Azure commercial marketplace really mean? What it really means is a unified product catalog, a catalog where you can buy any SaaS application related to your industry or horizontal. So whether it's retail industry or if it's a horizontal like data, AI or IoT. The, the whole concept is that we are providing our partners the same experience uh, that our sellers have around Microsoft first party products. We want uh, the publishers who are ISV partners to publish their applications uh, to sell their applications through our single unified product catalog and for our reseller community, our field uh, to have the same experience of being able to quote and sell using the Azure marketplace uh, in terms of the partner solutions that are available. We have the depth of partner solutions, almost 15,000 uh, such offers already in play and several thousand solutions that are already transactable, having the, the widest reach and the, the access to new channels that we want to provide to our customers and our partners. Some examples of companies that are already transacting on the marketplace, you'll see several of them uh, on the call today. You'll see several that are very, very disruptive. Uh, in fact, some like Uncrowd who've gotten the Microsoft Partner Award for this year, Many that are on this call are great solutions, partner solutions that are already transacting with our customers and their customers using the Azure Marketplace as a channel to sell uh, their SaaS applications uh, and also to be cloud first and digital first. And, and this is the, the channel that is cloud first and digital first. Now for the panel. So I'm going to invite our panelists to unmute themselves and I'm going to start from left to right from the top. Uh, Hugh Holman, if you could introduce yourself, a very brief introduction about you and your company. Sure. Um, uh, my name is Hugh Holman and I'm the CEO and co-founder of Observa. And uh, we envision a world where shoppers absolutely love uh, their shopping experience and uh, we help achieve that end by measuring in real time uh, store execution of merchandising and promotion for consumer brands and retailers to drive sales, uh, improve that consumer shopping experience and uh, optimize the supply chain. Wonderful. Alex from Everseen. Good afternoon, everybody, and thank you Shahir, for having us here. Alex Siskos, Chief Growth Officer of Everseen. Uh, Everseen is the global leader in visual AI software. We bring together AI and computer vision and uh, trying to help uh, retailers uh, of different shapes and kinds to effectively better shape process for better outcomes. Uh, as you mentioned, we started the world uh, as a loss prevention mechanism. We found ourselves spreading throughout the store and into the back room and all the way up into the supply chain. And uh, we'll speak a little bit more specific uh, to some of your questions and how we basically do that later on. Thanks once again. Thanks, uh, it gave the CEO point R. Hi everyone, so, uh, very pleased to be on the panel and uh, nice to meet you everyone. Uh, I'm, I'm Ege, I'm the CEO of Pointer. 
the blend of offline and online experiences using our location and mapping platform for so the brick and mortar stores become more digital with our platform and that's and we integrate for to make location work for those so i'm looking forward to the discussion today great again and i don't know if you're aware but your your camera is on we we love to see you but it's not required uh, because we've got everybody's beautiful pictures on my slide over here <laughs> thank you all right, I, uh, all right. yeah no worries um okay over to manish from zyn one thanks i <clears throat> I'm the chief product officer and co-founder of Zyne One. Uh, Zyne One is uh, reimagining personalization by applying artificial intelligence and machine learning techniques to deepen the understanding of customer behaviors. We uh, tackle a broad set of personalization use cases uh, that sort of uh, go across uh, and beyond relevancy into urgency and scarcity. Wonderful. Um, and then uh, Jordan from Imperity. Thank you, Sahir, and it's a great pleasure to be here with all of you today. Uh, my name is Jordan Elkin. I'm the Vice President of Product Marketing at Imperity. Imperity is the leading AI-powered customer data and identity platform built to help brands better know their customers, make better data-driven strategic decisions, and serve their customers at scale through personalization. We uh, help brands uh, unify customer data that's typically fragmented and siloed across the ecosystem, uh, use a, a multi-patented machine learning approach to resolve identities accurately. Uh, so help see the human beings within the customer base, build a full 360, and then enable brands to take action on that to drive better experiences for their customers. Wonderful. And uh, last but not the least, uh, Kaushik uh, is the CPO at Antuit.ai. Hi. Um, can you hear me? I'm on my phone. Okay. Yes, we can hear you, Kaushik. Okay. Okay, so thank you, Sahir. I really appreciate the opportunity. So uh, I was recently co-founder CEO of a company called Forecast Horizon, which mainly did uh, store level price optimization for apparel retail. Uh, we got acquired by Android and one of the interesting problems we are working on right now is uh, there's still a bunch of inventory in stores, even as you know uh, stores are going down in count and mall traffic is down. Uh, the problem we are helping solve is how do you prioritize stores to fulfill web orders? And even though you may not be executing price uh, differently by store, we can give you a leading indicator of how liable a particular piece of inventory is going to be in a particular store and how to use that information in optimizing uh, orders that uh, are fulfilled from, from the store. Great. Um, can can everybody uh, can can one of you just confirm that you're seeing this slide with everybody's pictures and, and name just confirming? Yeah. Yeah. Okay, yes. Excellent. OK, so then I'll go across. I'll start. I'll give everybody equal opportunity here to chime in. I've got four very pointed questions. I'd like for you to be as candid and as open with the audience today. So I really appreciate everybody doing that. Uh, so my first question, I'll start with Hugh. Hugh, can you uh, talk to us a little bit about um, how sh how are retailers and uh, CPG brands that you're working with, how are they responding to COVID? What type of response are you seeing? What types of challenges are you seeing? Well, um, you know, I, we've, we've all experienced this too, going to stores. Um, they're less welcoming today. Uh, the rules for in-store workers as well as shoppers has changed. You know, uh, PPE is required. Um, the in-store workers uh, um, have kind of a, a difficult environment to work in today, um, and it's a little bit scary. So it, there's been quite a bit of change. Um, at the same time, there have been massive shifts in demand. Um, which also impact the supply chain and both brands and the stores have had to adjust based on that. And so that impacts several things. So you see it both within product categories, like which products um, are available versus not, um, and, and demand shifts from uh, brand to brand, as well as via channels. Where are people shopping? Are they going to more convenience type stores versus the larger stores? You talked about the decline in visits to malls. A lot of malls were shut down completely, for instance. But then online obviously has been the big winner. Um, 
so this changes brands and how they focus, right? Um, and so things like promotions have changed considerably. It, to start off with, there was absolute chaos because of the supply chain challenges and lots of promotions basically were halted. Um, and what should happen is a shift towards where the consumer is focused, which a lot of that went towards online. And so for the, the brands and retailers that were able to make that shift, where they were measuring and understanding what was happening, uh, some came out winners, obvious winners, right? So Instacart was an obvious winner, Walmart had increases and so on, right? Um, from a product perspective, food was the biggest winner in online shopping. It had the largest shift. Now you gotta take into account that the, the smallest percentage of shoppers bought food online to start off with. And so an increase in online purchasing, whether for a store pickup or home delivery, um, uh, you know, a small change would, would impact uh, a change in the category, uh, you know, dramatically, but the, the shift was, was large all the same. Uh, one more thing I want to point out is that one type of marketing stores disappeared completely, and that is uh, demos or sampling of products. It was absolutely decimated. It went away on 100%. Um, and so the ability to shift and respond to those types of changes is, is something that all retailers and brands want to do. You know, uh, Observa even introduced a product called digital sampling to respond to that. So um, being able to measure, understand, and respond quickly was key. Yeah, that's a really interesting point. And, and Hugh, please hold that thought regarding digital sampling because we, we all know how big sampling is in the world of CPG and retail, especially when it comes to, you know, the trial aspect of uh, purchases. So let's come back to that point, but I'll move to Alex. Alex, from your vantage point, what are your customers saying? What are you seeing out there right now? Yeah, I'll piggyback off of Hugh. I mean, he made a fantastic point in terms of everything as we knew it pretty much blew away when it came to what you were doing in store. And if you allow me to kind of, I'll, I'll create a contrast between two different sets of channels. So the first one, I'm going to group together kind of food, mass, drug, and home improvement, right? And that started from just these retailers early on trying to understand what does it mean to be essential, all right? And effectively, you know, are they following local and federal guidelines? Are they complying? How are they keeping their people safe? You know, how are they keeping product on self? Uh, for all intents and purposes, how are they preserving cash, right? And this has been an endless pursuit of identifying what the normal is, right? And I don't know uh, to some extent that everybody's kind of gotten it uh, the right way or gotten it 100% or for that matter, uh, if they're complete, right? I think uh, when you look at it, it is an absolute mind shift of a mindset. You know, if I speak from my own retail background, when I used to work at Walgreens, right, we used to have the analogy of, hey, let's just react to what's happening. We'll recover, we'll restore, and we'll, we'll hit replay and rinse and repeat, right? And I think that if that was what described traditional retail, now we're in, and unfortunately, this is an overused word, but I'm going to throw it out there anyway, right? Everybody's defining this new resilient retail, right? And now it's not about reacting, it's about responding. It's not about necessarily recovering, it's about rebounding. And you know, it's not about restoring what you have, it's literally the proverbial change the wheel while you're running uh, and effectively you're retooling and you're reinventing, right? You know, along those lines. I think uh, you said something earlier on doubling down on digital. If I wasn't already in a digital transformation, uh, that's too bad, right? Because those that were effectively realized that, you know, roadmap uh, ideas got fast forwarded and accelerated. And while we were in the early part of uh, talking about other parts of the store, we were literally in a scenario where people asked us to lift and shift. And it started with, hey, based on how we do this in the front of the store, could you apply this to XYZ scenario? And here's the reasons why. So we found ourselves very quickly uh, being challenged to be even more agile using our data and using, you know, the way that we had trained our AI, you know, on certain instances that were around loss prevention to very quickly do those around what I would say is, uh, and you mentioned again, online grocery pickup and BOPIS that now are effectively uh, curbside pickup. That became a term for everybody. If I was to contrast the, that statement to C stores and QSR, We've seen an unbelievable pickup uh, from those guys saying, 
I want to copy what I'm seeing food, drug, and mass doing. I want to figure out how to do curbside pickup. I want to figure out how to engage the customer in a similar fashion. So once again, it's all about that digital transformation, playbooks being, you know, and um, uh, for all intents and purposes, uh, uh, studied from different angles and asking a question, why not? And very quickly saying, okay, how can I accelerate? And how can I move as quickly as I can with key partners, you know, down this path? So I'll pause right there. Yeah, no, several great points, and we'll talk about some of these uh, key findings in terms of what are, you know, what are you proud of in terms of customer stories? And I, I would love for you to share that uh, in the in the next uh, round of our 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 discussion. So Ige, I I wanted to bring you in because you you know you've got an interesting set of customers. Uh, both retail and and you've got some other customers too. So talk to us. Talk to us about what what are your customers saying? What, what's the feedback like from the uh, from the customer side of the house? So uh, it's been very interesting because I mean I didn't need to say nobody saw this coming, and then it's literally over a week or two things changed you know almost overnight, and then it's you know it's, you know it was a very interesting journey from a, a social point of view, but also from a commercial point of view as well. So. The, and the fact that we work very closely with many major retailers globally, as well as airlines as well, for example, in aviation, those were very badly hit, needless to say. And you know their revenues were down more than 90%, and it's not good. But I do definitely agree that take digital transformation. There's this you know joke on LinkedIn, you know, you know, which caused the digital transformation in your business? Is it was the CEO, was the CIO, was it, is it COVID? And the correct answer is COVID, right? So and it's it's a very, I mean, I, we really see that joke being, a, you know, reality so accurate because what I think this showed the world is anything can happen. And and those, I think, we might, you know, you mentioned Target earlier, you may you know, we spoke about Walmart just now. Those who can adapt, have that lean technology stack where they can launch products quickly, adapt, you know, change, add changes to their products quickly, quickly mobilize their workforce to doing, you know, more curbside or more online delivery, and then, you know, tomorrow when they when certain when certain states reopen, being able to pull, pull them back, and those who can adapt quickly are the winners of this of this crisis. So that's what we're seeing firsthand from our clients. Uh, and I, again, for example, one of the clients I won't name, but you know, one of the, the larger ones, they were able to launch a new digital product within a couple of weeks. Right? That's just very impressive. And those who can do that are the ones that are winning this crisis. Um, the one thing for sure from our perspective, and again, that's just more for during COVID, but also after COVID as well is, you know, I think we will inevitably see, first of all, the safest screen you have, you know, if you compare, you know, like I go, I shop at CVS, you know, there are those kiosk machines that, you know, we're used to now for using. But, you know, if you think about it from a hygiene point of view, this is actually probably not a good idea. And the safest screen you have is your smart device. It's your smartphone in your pocket. You're, you're the one only interacting with it. So that's the safest, probably the cleanest screen out of all the screens you see around you in a store. So using more mobile app based journeys, being able to make, you know, be, be, add better intelligence to your phone so it becomes a smart assistant in your pocket, I think it's just going to happen quicker. That was our vision at Pointer, you know, before COVID anyway, but we only believe this is going to fast track that journey and we'll see more and more, you know, self-serve on your own smartphone and also variable, et cetera, kind of use, kind of use cases for, for the shopper. Uh, we're also seeing some experience centers. So, you know, IKEAs and Nikes are doing these experience centers and then getting rid of, um, you know, some of the real estate so that you go and experience the brand, but then go shop online. We'll see more of that happening. So, you know, shopping doesn't have to happen in the store, but you still have the store. You still need that good experience, but the, the, the full journey will be an, a mixture of online and offline. So that's even more true now. So those are some of the changes we see and also contactless. So, you know, being, you know, in the same uh, vein of, using your phone for better use cases, being contactless in stores. Well, because there's no guarantee that this will not come back next year, or I, I really hope not, but I think this just show that we need to have, you know, less, a bit of less interaction, but a bit more digital. And that's now a, a kind of a mandate now. So that really is just fast track some of those journeys. So that's what we are seeing with our clients today. Wonderful, wonderful. Thank you. Manish, uh, you're at the kind of the cusp of uh, that uh, whole, uh, you know, the e-commerce wave. So give us your thoughts on what are the customers of Zyn One telling you and the others in the organization? Yeah, <clears throat> so um, Sai, we work uh, with a lot of uh, large retailers, department stores, as well as more uh, you know niche sort of uh, categories. 
And really, I want to sort of think about three uh, different areas in which uh, we see activity. You know, on the marketing side, uh, we see this, uh, uh, you know, focus uh, to deepen the understanding of customer behavior by thinking about, you know, sort of really what's happening mid funnel as a, as a key part of the customer journey. So the idea being, uh, you know, really as four months after the pandemic started, you know, we know it's going to have a lasting impact. We've also talked about the shifts in demand. And what's interesting is that, you know, as sort of uh, the pandemic ebbs and flows, consumer behavior is sort of following that and tracking that. So even though e-commerce revenues may have surged overall, the economic uncertainty is shifting, uh, you know, on the demand side, uh, the, the preference to essentials, uh, you know, preference to lower margin products and, and, and categories of that sort. Consumers are also likely to become price sensitive very quickly if, if this continues and exhaustion sets in. So you sort of take all of that in, and, and sort of look at it from the perspective that, you know, even pre uh, uh, COVID, you know, uh, online conversions were only at about 3%. You take 100% growth, which is sort of ephemeral here, you know, that's still a very small percentage of online uh, visitors that are actually converting to buyers. And the task is getting well, you know, for online retailers and marketing teams to be able to sort of really react and 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 respond. You know, I think as Alex said, I really love that notion. You know, it's reacting is not enough. We need to respond. And so, changing uh, and identifying changes in consumer pattern, the behavior patterns, is a further sort of uh, you know layer of complexity. Uh, as especially as you know, sort of operating costs rise, margins erode, and so on and so forth. So. The focus from marketing teams is to be able to really understand short term changes in trends in consumer behavior. So that's number one. Number two, uh, I think to add to X point, um, you know, the focus on omni channel is something that we've seen sort of increase substantially. You talked about Sahir, uh, you know, sort of the the uh, 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 click and collect a set of use cases, curbside and, and geofencing and sort of location technologies. IOT sort of uh, going with that, uh, that's an area of focus as well. And then the third area is sort of from the commerce perspective, the commerce teams are doubling down on a set of initiatives that are strategic long term on pricing and really thinking about what dynamic pricing sort of means and looks like. So there's a combination of sort of new investments being looked at that are perhaps uh, just stretching a little bit further, thinking about, uh, you know, what does sort of the recovery from COVID look like in terms in terms of the inventory buildup? How do you match it up with demand? What does real time merchandising sort of look like for e-commerce and uh, pricing? Of course, has got a strong sort of factor on uh, personalization of offers, and then of course broader than that, you know, dynamic pricing itself. Wonderful, thanks, Manish. Uh, so, Jordan, uh, um, customer is the heart of every retail story, and in fact, every brand story. Uh, give us your perspective on what your um, uh, customer data platform. Uh, what is the response like? What are the what are the retailers and brands telling you? Well, so here we have the good fortune at Imperity to work with a very broad swath of retail, from global publicly traded brands through uh, digitally native e-commerce startups. And uh, unfortunately, we have quite a few brands that fall into those hard hit sectors that you described earlier: fashion and apparel. Uh, discretionary goods uh, like leisure. And so uh, I'll just start by acknowledging that we've seen uh, brand leaders go through all five stages of grief over the last few months in, in the process of, of catching up. Now that the dust is settled, we're, we're actually starting to um, detect a pretty interesting shift in, in sentiment and strategy, which is brands that are feeling uh, energized and, and focused by the disruption. Because in, in some ways, this disruption has catalyzed or accelerated a transformation that they've been trying to make for, for years towards becoming more customer centric. Uh, as Manish described, putting the uh, kind of knowledge and understanding of the customer at the, the center of, of business operations. A few concrete examples from uh, from our experience with retails retailers. Um, there, there's been a huge amount of energy and momentum behind the shift towards direct to consumer business model. So if you think about a, a retailer that uh, operates both a wholesale channel uh, and then a direct to consumer channel, uh, it's, it's typically been quite challenging to meaningfully shift the balance uh, of those different business models over the past few years. 
all of a sudden there's an incredible opportunity to kind of reset. Um, and, and the brands that are starting to take advantage of this um, are looking for new and innovative ways to uh, capture customer data, all of the data on the path to purchase intent so that they can market directly to, to their consumers um, th through whatever disruption the future may hold. Secondly, um, we, we work with many brands that are uh, encumbered by a, a, an oversaturated retail footprint, and many more stores than, than the optimal fleet size. And, and in many cases, they've, this, this isn't news to them. They're aware of this. Um, they've been held back in, in their efforts to right size their fleets or achieve the right omnichannel balance because of expectations of the street, long-term commercial leases that they might be operating. Uh, all of a sudden, uh, the, the reset button got, got pressed and it gives them an opportunity to completely re-envision what the optimal channel balance looks like um, in, in such a way that they can establish and maintain digital first relationships with, with many more of their customers. Um, and, and then finally, um, you know, as a result of migrating um, more demand and, and data capture into their own ecosystem in orbit, we see brands shifting away um, from expensive third party uh, driven acquisition strategies, especially during contractionary budget times, uh, towards really soul searching. How can they make the most of their, their first party data uh, and communicate with customers on, on free or low cost channels in an effective and personalized way? Wonderful. Uh, Jordan, that was very insightful and thank you for sharing the, the whole notion around uh, you know, how customer data is now going through a very, very uh, some some way shifting times uh, and how what retailers and brands can do about it and thank you for your candidness. Kaushik, I, this whole story started when you and I were talking about you know how you're trying to help different retailers address um, you know not just inventory uh, related issues but also how you can help them improve their delivery preparedness um, in, in the stores. So talk to us about you know, what are you hearing from retailers? You've got some really good customers too. Um, go yes, uh, yes. Uh, so yeah, I have some of the customers uh, actually listed in the bankruptcy list in your earlier slides too, right? So we are helping sort of the Nikes to some of the other uh, mall-based customers whose uh, foot traffic has fallen. So two things, right? I mean, I'll just give you a couple of numbers as sort of anchor points. We are working with somebody who was kind of slow on the digital journey, right? Like they had a low income penetration, I think in the 15 to 20%. And all of a sudden in the last two months, that number has shot up like 40, 50%. And as they look into their key holiday period, uh, between sort of, uh, you know, Black Friday and Cyber Monday, they're expecting 4 million orders with a warehouse that can process 150,000 units a day. So the stores, I mean, it's not a nice to have, it's almost a must have, right? The inventory in the stores have to be optimized to ship web orders. And then a whole set of complexities come into play. Uh, and we are helping them in two aspects. One is how do you anticipate orders surrounding a, a store, right? So it's not just people walking into the store, but what are the zip codes that order uh, in the vicinity of the store? How do we take that demand signal and put enough inventory into that store to be able to handle those orders while paying attention to space capacity as well as labor capacity, right? When you're handling those orders in the store. And then uh, once an order comes in, what is the best store to ship that order from uh, based on a number of different factors, right? And one of the stories that we were talking about so here, and I'll just share with the group. So for example, if I place an order for an outerwear from Boston, um, and I have two stores, let's say, right? Like one in New York and one in Atlanta. The New York store may be closer to the Boston customer, uh, but from our algorithms, we can say that, hey, that New York store is likely to sell that outerwear at $69.99, whereas the Atlanta store, because it has lower demand and higher inventory, is likely to sell it at $49.99. And this kind of uh, price disparity based on inventory and demand variance is actually quite common. So it would be better to ship that order from the Atlanta store, even though it may be uh, a longer distance and slightly higher shipping, 
but it reduces the markdown liability in that store, right? So it makes the inventory more productive. So getting this kind of intelligence, you know, through the supply and the demand chain in near real time is what we are working uh, toward. And so it opens up a whole set of possibilities that, you know, the retailers were kind of on the fringe. They were sort of thinking about doing it, but I think this pandemic has actually forced them to become uh, very efficient uh, in, in this aspect. Wonderful, Kaushik. There is a, it's a great uh, way of describing how to put more focus on data and intelligence in these trying times. So, and and by the way, all your solutions are based on, uh, you know, a lot of use of artificial intelligence, ML models, uh, self-learning, and also a lot of video intelligence, a lot of location-based intelligence. Now, I'm going to take a pause here. I really want us to talk to our audience today about one customer story that you're proud of and why. And to keep it brief, because I want to I want to make sure that I ask you one more question, each one of you. And, and so very briefly, please, I'll start with Ige from Point R. Uh, one customer story that you're proud of uh, and why? That's a great question. I would say uh, that's sort of, that's the American department store. Uh, I can't I, I, let me not name them, but hopefully that that's you know that gives you uh, an idea. Uh, then they have more than they're close to a thousand locations across the country. The one thing that really is that I found that I'm very proud of with working with them is really. The fact that it's not only for one use case, they're, they're truly omnichannel. We are talking about automatic product location in the store with the store hand, you know, handheld devices using by used by the associates. We're talking about offers and loyalty for the customers, whether that's on the website or on the mobile app. And we're talking about the analytics of just you know, understanding flows. And it, in addition, journeys such as, for example, one new problem they had was with online return orders, when you return to you can return to any store which is good for the customer, but then that's what ends up happening is you get one shirt showing up in one store online and another customer goes to buy it and then they can't find it in the store, right? So actually there are a lot of inefficiencies across different departments in operations, in marketing, in, in, in e-commerce, and they were able to use our existing same platform to align them all together. Whereas we've seen that, so that's, that's something that I think I'm proud of because it touched in so many different aspects of the business. So I'll keep it brief, but yeah, that's something I would, that comes off the top of my head. One wonderful story. Hugh, how about yourself from Observer? Yeah, absolutely. Um, I, I just want to make the point that uh, information is key. And as there are shifts like we've been seeing in demand and uh, uh, challenges to you know meet the changes in demand, you need that information faster. So what we found, and I'll talk about one client in particular, um, they were struggling with where is my product, right? Which stores have it and which stores don't. And, the, you know, understanding on kind of a weekly basis is one level, but the shifts and changes have been coming so fast that that's not enough. And so the ability to provide that reporting on a consistent basis over time so they can see the trends, what's actually happening at a store level is, you know, um, really uh, something new in the market. And um, the thing about that data is they're now able to make decisions on shifts in supply in, in near real time. So instead of looking at uh, how they adjust, you know, manufacturing supply on a quarterly or monthly perspective, maybe even weekly, they can get down to what's happening in the middle of the week. And the thing about, I want to, I want to bring up another point. And the thing about um, AI today is that it's really about speed. It's adding the speed for us. It's the speed of reporting, speed of delivering analytics, and ultimately including business rules and taking action. So what are the actions that need to happen? And so if you can go very, very quickly from measurement to action, then that's where there's real power in responding to shifts. And that's the place in the market that we're at. And I think that this COVID situation has shown more clearly to our clients um, that they really need to be able to understand what's happening, what the underlying situation is, where they really haven't had visibility in the past. So the client that is now able to redirect trucks to deliver product to stores midweek 
um, to meet that those changes in consumer demand, those shifts, and make sure that the right products are at the right place, that's super powerful for them in meeting those customer or consumer expectations. Great story, great story. Alex, uh, you, you, could you share a story and and with the with the with everyone today that you're proud of? Absolutely. I, I think I'm going to pick up on on the nerve and the thread that we all kind of created here. And you know that I was smiling because I'm not going to be able to mention anybody. So I, I'm going to mention <laughs> two and talk about them. He's laughing. I'm going to mention two and talk about them at the same time. I think the key aspect for us was taking compute where the decision needs to be made. And when you are there, no matter where that there is, right, we can call it the edge, we can call it whatever we want, is doing that decision real time, right? And what I like to call continuous intelligence, right? I think the biggest story that I learned from two of our key customers in the US that combine between them, we're in over, you know, uh, 2,500 stores, is they can no longer afford to build bespoke solutions. So when we sought out and our partnership with Microsoft, and this is not necessarily a, uh, you know, kind of a plug into us, right? We truly challenge ourselves to how do you define an uncommon partnership, right? And an uncommon partnership was pretty much opening the eyes to retailers that this whole OPEX CAPEX game, it's, it's, it's time. And if there's one thing that COVID did is exactly that, right? How can you lower the cost? Well, at the same time, you benefit my shoppers, right? And so as I see us moving, not only from one solution to another because the use cases have similarities, but going back to the existing solution and working with you guys from everything on ASC to 5G, this is literally how the retailers are thinking about it, right? They're looking at obstacles that are both on the physical side, you know, the equation, connectivity, infrastructure, but also just like one of my fellow panelists mentioned, what business questions should I solve first and why? And looking for that to happen, not only in real time, but have that impact, that benefit be instant. Yeah, and so on that note, I want to bring in Jordan real quick. Jordan, can you share a customer story and then we'll wrap up with Kaushik and uh, Manish as well. So Jordan, over to you. Well, I'm super gratified when I think about the story of the Texas based uh, jewelry retailer, Kendra Scott, uh, incredible omnichannel retailer um, has, has been growing really quickly. Um, starting earlier this year, had laid out like a six month rollout plan for a BOPIS program, buy online, pick up in store. Needless to say, when early March came around and the world changed forever, they went back to the drawing board and reevaluated their plans. And by sifting through the patterns in demand and, and product preferences in, in their very own first party data, they were able to make the case for a much more rapid transformation. So within the period of three weeks or a month, they were able to condense all of the planning um, and logistics that they had previously thought would take six months. Uh, and it was because of the incredible opportunity that they saw when they looked into their own first party data. And so now it's, uh, I'm, I'm proud to be working with a retailer that is able to meet customer demand in a safe and responsible way. Wonderful. And um, Manish uh, or Kaushik? Kaushik, why don't we give you the chance and we can have Manish close it out. Kaushik? Yeah, <clears throat> sure. I mean, it's a New York specialty retailer. Um, we did the first sort of prioritization of stores and they ran a pilot where uh, they compared a particular season code and saw a 40% improvement in turns for that inventory and then quickly rolled it out to the rest of the brand. And then they had a sort of an outlet and another sub brand under it. And, um, you know, all of this happened very quickly. Actually, I mean, the, the implementation started pre COVID. So I think that's what I'm most proud of. <clears throat> okay. And Manish, uh, over to you, sir. One customer story you're really proud of. Should we lose Manish? Uh, yes, Sahir, sorry. Yeah, um, can you hear me? Yeah. So I'd like to point out, um, you know, sort of work that's happened with the top 10 US department store, you know, 40 million plus customer base, thousand stores. You know, pre-COVID, they had uh, more than 40 use cases with us. And during COVID, in sort of this uh, stormy times, they added another four use cases. Uh, you know, Hugh mentioned uh, sort of speed of analysis. Uh, I want to sort of point out uh, speed of sensing as another piece that really helped us. 
um, you know, we've uh, at Zine One focused on new ways to model short term behaviors, and we call this the customer DNA analysis. And through this, uh, you know, being able to do a, a set of offers, real time offers that account for shopping behaviors with uh, that change with high degree of accuracy. We were able to deploy this, um, you know, where the AI model was typically based on 18 months, automatically sensed and adapted that the last three months were the most relevant and use that to generate you know, net incremental margin positive revenue. So something that I'm really proud of is, uh, of course, uh, not only did we accomplish this, we've sort of cemented our target, uh, our partnership here uh, in, in targeted accounts and are working with Microsoft to apply these to another top 10 department store. Wonderful, Manish, thank you so much. I, I want to bring Dion in for some closing words. I know we've gone over, but this was a power panel. A lot of interesting insights around data, AI, personalization, e-commerce, uh, video intelligence, as well as uh, fulfillment and uh, curbside pickup related solutions. I know there were some questions around that, which I'll circulate later, but if anybody is looking for curbside related solutions, uh, you can talk to Point R and, and Kaushik, but if you're looking for CDP, it'll be Imperity, uh, customer data platforms, video intelligence, ever seen observer and e-commerce personalization sign one. We thank all our partners who joined in. Over to you, Dion. Thank you so much. Um, that was great. Thank you so much for all the information you shared. Um, that was amazing. A few things in the Q&A chat, I did share a link to the survey. If you have a few moments, we would really appreciate um, you to fill that out. The first question is going to ask you what your event code is. That will help us make sure that the responses you give are go back towards this event. The event code for this one is 7553, and that is also in the Q&A window. Um, if you came late or had to drop early um, or want to re-listen to any other, listen again to any part of this presentation, this will be on our Microsoft Reactor YouTube page in the next 24 to 48 hours, and then the slides will be in the description, and the link for the YouTube page is also in the Q&A section. And then if you um, are interested in finding out about more of the events we have upcoming with the Reactor, you can find that on our Meetup page, which is meetup.com slash Microsoft Reactor Redmond, and the link to that is also in the Q&A as well. Um, Sihir, did you have any closing comments? No, I wanted to thank everybody and thanks for the extra time. Have a wonderful day, everyone. Thanks so much. Bye-bye. Thank you. Thank you, Sihir. Take care.